Facebook or uh, one of the other internet mechanisms. I think that people sometimes, sometimes people <laughs> capture the program and they stream it other ways. So I want to welcome those who are joining us uh, on Facebook and let you know that we're beginning a new series and we're not sure how long it will last because we're going to go through all of the primary parables of Jesus. And um, there's just so many rich nuggets and teachings that are in there. Uh, we have a special offer we'd like to tell you about. Now these offers are not one where you, you call and we mail it to you. This is you get it through texting. So those of you who have your, your fingers and your phones available, if you want a free copy of this book, Teach Us to Pray, and it's called, you just text the word PRAY, P-R-A-Y, to, here's a number, 40544. If you want a free copy of this book, Teach Us to Pray, text the word PRAY to 40544 and uh, you'll see the information there how you can get a copy. And as I mentioned, we're going to be going through the parables and um, I, I get to sort of kick this off. And one of my favorite things is teaching the parables of Christ because there's so much just beautiful information in there about the Christian life. Uh, the parable of my choice is tonight the Good Samaritan. Now, who knows where you find that? Luke chapter 10. Matter of fact, some of the parables you find in virtually all the Gospels, well, John doesn't go so much into the parables as the, the um, synoptic Gospels, but um, this is only found in the Gospel of Luke. There's several parables that you only find in Luke. The prodigal son, the story of Zacchaeus, and the, the ten coins that are lost. So if you go in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to start with verse 25 and you sort of have to introduce what brought about the the interest in this parable. And it says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So often Jesus answered a question with a question. So the, he answered and he said, You should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you've answered rightly. You get 100%. Do this, and you'll live. Well, he felt a little silly. He asked a question, had a simple answer, and, and uh, he thought, well, you know, we've got to go a little deeper. And then he said, um, who is my neighbor? So I'm supposed to love my neighbor. We know who God is, but how do you explain who my neighbor is? And so then, with that, Jesus launches into a parable to help him understand who his neighbor is and how to love his neighbor. And he begins, matter of fact, I may read uh, all the way through the parable, then we'll back up and we'll take it apart piece by piece. And Jesus said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, he came and he looked, and he passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, and brought him to an inn and he took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I'll repay you. So, in conclusion, Jesus says, Which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And now the lawyer answers, He who showed mercy on him. He didn't even want to say the Samaritan. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. So there you have it, in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And a number of Bible scholars have argued for a millennia whether Jesus was recounting an actual event or whether it was a parable. We're going to have to approach it as though it was a parable because no names are mentioned in the story. There's no way really to uh, check online and see if this was in the headlines of Jerusalem back then. But um, it's, it's possible that this actually happened. But then Jesus uses the event to teach a lesson. So for that purpose it, it is something as a parable. 
Now, with that, I want to tell you about an experiment that was done. A Princeton Seminary professor asked for volunteers to do an extra assignment. He got a group of 15 students. They gathered at Spear Library, and then he divided the group in a 15 into three groups of five, 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 five. He gave the groups, each group, uh, five envelopes telling them to proceed immediately, he told the first group of five, to proceed immediately across camp campus to Stewart Hall. They had 15 minutes to get there. If they didn't arrive on time, that would affect their grade. He called this the high hurry group. A minute or two later, without the others knowing, he handed out envelopes to another five. Their instructions were to go over to Stewart Hall, but they were given 45 minutes. After they departed, he then called in the last group of five, and he gave them envelopes with instructions. They were called the low hurry group. They were given three hours to get to Stewart Hall across the campus. Now unknown to any of these students, the teacher had arranged with three students from Princeton University Drama Department to meet them at various places along the way, acting as if they were people in great need. In front of Alexander Hall, one of the drama students was going around covering his head with his hands and moaning out in great pain. As they passed by Miller Chapel on their way to Stewart Hall, they found another fellow who was on the steps lying face down as if unconscious. And finally, on the very steps of Stewart Hall, he had a third drama student who was acting out the part of an epileptic seizure. It's interesting that of the first group of five students, as they passed the different acting students pretending they were in great need, none of them stopped. Um, of the second group, two of the five stopped to help. And of the third group, all five stopped. And so in summary, they were wondering if the story of the Good Samaritan could be partly because he wasn't in too big a hurry. <laughs> it seems like sometimes we're in such a hurry we can't help. And I thought that was just an, an interesting experiment that he did in that, uh, in that story. Well, I want to break this down for you and let's begin going through the story of the Good Samaritan. I remember when I was growing up in New York City. You may, it was made national news, so some of you may still remember this that um, this lady tripped on the curb, a very busy intersection in New York, broke her leg so she couldn't even stand on it. She laid there on the sidewalk moaning as everybody passed by for 45 minutes before anyone actually stopped to help. Finally a cab stopped, picked her up and took her to the hospital. Now I grew up in New York City and so I believe that because you often saw people that were drunk or on drugs or um, didn't look like they were mentally well, doing all kinds of bizarre things and it's like you think, I won't get from point A to point B if I stop for everybody that's having some kind of distress. And you know, you're in a small country town, you pass someone on the street, you nod, you say hello. New York City, just everybody's just, I'm on my way, on my mission. And you wonder if sometimes we're so busy doing our own thing in life we don't care about others. So, when you get to the actual parable, we'll skip by, we've already read what the lawyer said. He says, a certain man went down. First thing I want you to notice is what direction is he going? Down. Going down. And he's going from what city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem to Jericho. Now Jerusalem is the city of God. It means city of peace. So he's called the holy city. He's got his back to the holy city and he's going down to Las Vegas. Jer Jericho, you remember that's where Zacchaeus lived, who was the chief of publicans. Jericho was the, um, it was a city cursed. Jerusalem was a city blessed. You remember when Joshua conquered Jericho and he said, cursed is the man that ever rebuilds it. Someone disobeyed and they did rebuild it. And the curse of Joshua said, he will lay the foundation in his firstborn, that's the first thing you do when you build, and he will set up the gates in his youngest. And the man who rebuilt Jericho, you read it in the Bible, when he laid the foundation, his firstborn died. And by the time he finished and he set up the gates, his youngest died. So it's a cursed city. So this man is going from the blessed city to the cursed city. He's going from up to down. And on that road, he falls among thieves. Uh, you've talked about the great fall 
when you speak in theological terms of the fall, what are you talking about? You're not talking about autumn. You're talking about the fall of Adam and uh, the fall of mankind. And what, is it, what happens? It says, He fought, fell among thieves. Does the Lord tell us that the devil is a thief and a robber? And he says, a thief doesn't go through the door. And, uh, but he jumps over the wall, speaking of the devil again. Who strip him of his clothing. Have you noticed how many times in the Bible the devil strips people? What happened to Adam and Eve after their encounter with the serpent? What happened to their, didn't they have a, rope, a wardrobe malfunction? Yeah. As they say. <laughs> they lost their clothes. Uh, the, the light of robes of light went out. Have you remember, you remember reading the story about the demoniac? He's filled with a legion of demons. What did he wear? Nothing. And then there's another story, I think it's in Acts 16, where it talks about this, these seven sons of Sceva, who was a priest, tried to cast a devil out of a man. And they said, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, come out. And the devil laughed at them and he said, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but I don't know you. And the demon-possessed man le leapt on those seven boys and it says he beat them up and they fled wounded and naked. Have you ever noticed that? Seems like these encounters, the devil is into shame and he shames people. So, um, and they stripped him. And it says they, uh, of course they robbed him of everything valuable and they left him half dead. You know, that half dead condition sort of describes the lost. Uh, you're on death row, but you're alive. If you're a sinner and you don't know Jesus, Jesus, uh, John says, he that has the son has life, he that has not, the son has not life. And you remember where Christ said, um, let the dead bury the dead. What was he talking about? Zombies? Or is he talking about people that don't have the Lord? They're spiritually dead. Uh, Paul said, uh, describes those who are dead in trespasses and sins. So that's how the devil leaves people. Uh, they're on death row. And, um, and then it goes on, it says, all right, the man is laying there. So you've got the picture. He's on the road down to Jericho. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, I'm going to stop right there. All right, the man is laying there. He's not totally dead. He's half dead. He's probably semi-conscious. He can't get up himself. He was going down the road alone. The thieves, part of the reason they stripped him is because you didn't have credit cards back then. People often hid their money in their clothes. And, um, and the man's beaten up. He's laying there. He's probably got broken ribs and he's bleeding. He's half dead. They've beaten him pretty good. And he's maybe praying. And as he's praying, he hears a shuffle and he looks around the bend and he, he sees there in this, this rugged canyon. By the way, there's a section of road between Jerusalem and Jericho that had very steep sides. It was the haunt. It was a rugged country with a trail going through it. And it was called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. Now, you know, David grew up not far from Jerusalem, in Bethlehem. And so when he said, Yea, though I go through the Valley of the Shadow of Death, this was a dangerous place. Um, every city's got areas you try to avoid that are they're, they're prime geography for bandits. You can hit and run. That's what the thieves did. They robbed them and they ran. And so he's looking in the corner of the canyon and around the trail. He says, ah, praise the Lord. God has heard my prayers. It's the pastor. It's a priest. And as he draws closer, the man is moaning. And... Uh, he thinks, I don't know exactly what he thought, but I'm, I'm surmising that the priest is thinking, wow, fresh blood. Dust hasn't even settled. These thieves probably aren't far away. I better get out of here. And by the way, he's probably suffering like that because he's done something wrong and God is punishing him. And I don't want to get in, I don't want to interfere with God's judgment. Who knows what he's thinking? But I've heard all kinds of arguments. So he, um, it says that he passes by on the other side. He's actually in the lane where the man is and he changes lanes to go around him. 
And he can just he picture the man laying there going, oh, but Pastor, but, oh no, don't leave me. And he just turns his back and walks away. Well, he's probably pretty discouraged. But then it says, likewise, a Levite. Now, Levites weren't quite priests. They were more like your elders and deacons. The high priests, the sons of Aaron, would serve as priests. And the Levites, they took of the other things in the sanctuary. And um, he comes down the road. And uh, it says, he looked. That means he stopped. I think in some versions you'll say, he looked upon him. He slowed down. And he maybe stopped and looked around. And maybe he took his license number. And he said, you know, when I get to Jericho, I will send a tow truck. Or I'll call an ambulance. But this is not my job. I don't know if any of you have ever seen. It's really pretty funny. It's a poster. And these road painters in Maine, I think it was, their job was to paint the line down the middle of the road. And somebody had hit a possum or a raccoon. I don't know. And they're the poor dead thing was laying in the middle of the road. And the paint line goes right down the middle of the uh, varmint. And the, the poster under it, it says, not my job. <laughs> they thought it's not my job to pick it up and get it out of the road. <laughs> so they just painted right through the middle of this uh, roadkill. Any of you seen that before? Yes. No. Oh, yes. <laughs> not my job. And who knows, that's what he was thinking. He said, well, you know, Nobody is around to notice that I'm not going to do anything. And he looks like he's half dead. He'll never make it. You know how many people have survived because even though they look like they're half dead, someone intervened. And uh, I've heard incredible stories of soldiers on the battlefield and they thought they'll never make it. The first medic went by and said they'll never make it. Someone else came along and gave him care and they did make it. And so uh, he didn't even give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he was going to send for help. He did stop. Maybe he prayed. That should be good enough. For years, um, I, I spent years hitchhiking. You know, from the time I ran away from home, first time I was 13, but mostly from the time I was like 15, I did a lot of hitchhiking around the country. And I mean, I hitchhiked all the way from Florida to Maine, from Florida to California and up and down from southern northern California. I mean, I, I, I've spent hours waiting on the road begging for a ride. You don't see it so much anymore, but some of you remember the 60s, 70s, 80s. There's a lot of hitchhikers on the road. And I remember sometimes after I became a Christian, I still was doing a lot of hitchhiking. When I first moved to northern California, I did it hitchhiking. I didn't have a car. I'd take one backpack load at a time. And um, I remember making a silly vow. I'd stand by the road so long, I'd see cars slow down, I'd think, oh, give me a ride, they want to give you a ride. And I'd get so frustrated, I'd think, they're going my way, I'm not going to hurt them. I might even entertain them if they just pick me up and there's room in their car. And I, I used to just think, Lord, please give me a ride. And if I ever get a car, I promise I will pick up every hitchhiker I see. Now, I think the Lord's forgiven me for that reckless vow I made as a teenager because I have not kept it. But, you know, in desperation, you say strange things. And for a while there, I tried. I mean, once I finally did get a car, I had a VW Bug. I'd pick up two, three people at one time with their dog. I mean, I, I tried to pick up everybody that I saw hitchhiking. And I still do. But I noticed that as I got a little older and I got in more of a hurry and my cars got a little better, as I would drive down the road and I'd see someone hitchhiking, I'd think, well, you know, I, I don't know how far they're going and uh, they, don't look, they don't look like they smell very good. <laughs> and, and I started becoming uh, more discriminating. And sometimes I've caught myself, I'd drive by someone, I was in a hurry and I thought, I can't really slow down right now. And I'd, I'd say, well, this car's right behind me, I can't safely stop. Or what if there's a policeman around and they're on, the, they're on the illegal part of the freeway and I'd have all these rationalizations. And then I'd say, but I'll pray for them. Lord, please send them a ride. I remember I did that once. I was on my way to Redwood Camp Meeting to preach about Jesus and the love of Jesus. And there was a guy hitchhiking on the road. And I drove by, 
And I'm, I, I thought, well, I'll pray for him. I'm, I'm late to preach. And I thought, you're supposed to pick him up. And I argued with myself so long that I must have gone a mile and a half down the road. And I thought, you're getting further and further. I said, oh, my conscience, I'm never going to forgive myself. I finally turned around. And I went back, and the guy was still there, and I picked him up. And uh, I was able to talk to him and pray with him before I dropped him off. And, uh, but I caught myself at first. I thought, I'll just say a prayer for him. You ever have a conviction like that? Maybe not. I'm not trying to give you a guilt trip about hitchhikers. That's just me. This is just a personal thing. So don't think that Pastor Doug's telling us to pick up all the hitchhikers. But have you ever struggled thinking, I've got to go back to somebody I was supposed to talk to and I'm missing this opportunity? And the Holy Spirit tells you and then it works out and you go, oh boy, I'm so glad I listened. And then you think, oh Lord, how many times have I not listened and I've missed opportunities to say something for Jesus because I was in a hurry. Well, the Levite, he slowed down but he still changed lanes, verse 32, and passed by on the other side. But then, it says a certain Samaritan. Now, just to give you the context, um, Samaritans, for the Jews, were the lowest of the low. Matter of fact, just to give you an idea, when the religious leaders wanted to insult Jesus, they said, thou hast a demon and you are a Samaritan. Well, it's pretty bad if you think, boy, I, I'm looking for the best curse word I can think of and you call someone a Samaritan. It was so bad that when the disciples had to go to town to buy groceries, and the, when they were passing through Samaria, they had to go through Samaria from Galilee to Jerusalem, and when they were passing through Samaria, they did not want Jesus to be contaminated because the Jews believed that if the shadow of a Samaritan passed over you, you would be unclean. And so... And they thought, Lord, we don't want you to be defiled, so we'll go buy the groceries and come and get you something. You just sit by the well here where you can avoid being contaminated. And, um, and they come back and he's talking to a Samaritan woman of all things. They couldn't understand that. Her shadow all over him. It was that bad. So when Jesus said, then a Samaritan, you've got to understand how they felt about each other back then. Um... That's why it also says in Luke, Jesus heals ten men, and the one that came back to thank him was what? A Samaritan, of all things. And um, so he says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed down that road, he came to where he was. Now, all right, so the man is, the man is fading in and out of consciousness. The flies are starting to buzz around. They're circling buzzards overhead. And, and uh, he sees that the priest goes by. And then one of the deacons comes and stops. And he's going, oh, oh, praise the Lord, thank you. And then he leaves. And he's thinking, oh, this isn't good. And he's dehydrated. And then he hears the clip-clop, clip-clop of somebody coming with a donkey. And he looks, and he can tell right away from his attire, it's a Samaritan. And the man thinks, oh my own pastor and deacon pass by. What's this guy going to do to me? He's going to finish me off and there'll be no witnesses. They, they hated each other that much. And so it tells us that um, when he came to where he was, it says he had compassion on him. And he went to him. And, he be and I can see as the Samaritan man comes over to him, He's thinking, no, no, please don't finish me off. And he kneels down gently and he calms him. And it says, he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Now, where did he get the bandages? Do you think he had in the glove box of his donkey a first aid kit? I think he probably tore up some, uh, I think he tore up some clothes. That's usually what they made bandages out. And then it says he poured in oil. What's oil a symbol of? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. And wine, a symbol of the blood of Christ. Here's someone that fell among thieves. Do you know Jesus was something of a Samaritan? You know what Samaritans were? Samaritans were half-breed Jews. To give you the history, 
Uh, during the time of Hezekiah, shortly after, the king of Assyria came down and he attacked the northern kingdom. You realize the kingdom of Israel was divided in two parts. Southern kingdom, the sons of David reigned. They had some good kings and some bad kings, but they were the sons of David. They still had the temple. They tried to stay true to the Lord. Northern kingdom, they rebelled. It was a civil war. Uh, Jeroboam began to make idols. They started to commingle Baal worship with the worship of the true God. The capital was Samaria. That's where you get the word Samaritan. It used to be a Jewish capital, uh, which came from a Hebrew man named Samar, I think, that a a Amri bought the land from. And, um, but when they were conquered by Assyria, many of the ten tribes intermarried with the Assyrians, and one of the Assyrian kings, he sent the people, his own people, Assyrians down there. Lions began to kill. There was a plague of lions because no one had lived in the country for a while. Lions began to, man-eaters, I guess, kill people. And they said, this is a curse of the gods. We better send some Jewish priests down there to teach them the God of the land so that the curse will be lifted. So they sent some priests down there and they started to commingle the Assyrian religion with the Jewish religion. The Samaritans believed you're supposed to worship on Mount Gerizim. Remember the Samaritan woman was arguing with Jesus, what mountain should we worship on? The uh, Jews, of course, Jerusalem. And Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, lest she have any confusion, salvation is of the Jews. Um, They believed in the five books of Moses, but they didn't accept the rest. So they were kind of like half-breeds. They had some Jewish blood and some Assyrian blood. You look at the family tree of Jesus. Did he have some non-Jewish blood? Did he have some uh, Canaanite through Rahab? Some Moabite through Ruth? And other various and sundry uh, people, if you look at his family tree. And so uh, Jesus was... Half God, and half man, except that's not accurate. He's 100% God and 100% man, but you and I can't figure that out. And so Jesus is like the Good Samaritan. We are the person who fell among thieves. The devil is the thief. So just as we're filling in what the symbols are here, so he pours in oil, a symbol of what? Holy Spirit. And the wine? The blood of the covenant, Jesus tells us that. The, the bandages? That represents the, um, his righteousness. Clothing is what they made those out of. And it says he put them on his own animal. Now in the Bible, an animal is a symbol of strength. It says it's through the strength of the oxen that the, the fields are plowed. This man has no strength of his own, and so he gets the strength from the Samaritan who gives it to him. And he has compassion on him. Now, do you know what the, pity, the difference is between pity and compassion? You read the parable, and I won't get into this parable right now. In Matthew 18, it talks about the parable of the unmerciful debtor. And it says, the king was moved with compassion. You know what the word sympathy means? Or what does pathos mean? It means to feel. Sympathy means you feel. Compassion is talking about your feeling, con, your feeling with another person. Uh, I heard an s- illustration one time that um, there was a, an accident in San Francisco years ago with a streetcar, one of these trolley cars. It struck and ran over a pedestrian, except it didn't run completely over. The person would hit, and they were underneath the carriage, and they were alive, but they were badly wounded. And, uh, you know, when there's an accident, the whole, all the people gather around. There's a crowd, and, and they stop the car, and uh, the man was underneath the car, and he's moaning, and... Several people kind of leaned over and looked underneath and said, oh, you know, help's on the way. And one businessman got down on his, uh, basically his face, and he crawled, kind of did the combat crawl underneath the dirty carriage of the streetcar, got right up to the man, put his hand on his shoulder and says, I, I'm going to be here with you. You're going to make it. Just hang in there. And I heard someone say, now that's the difference between pity and compassion. Pity looks down. Compassion gets down. The Levite maybe stopped and had pity, as though there's some value in that. Have you ever watched the evening news and just thought, oh, what a shame. That's appropriate. There's nothing you can do. You just have pity. But that's not quite the same as compassion. If you look on the news and there's been a hurricane and all these people are suffering, and you say, isn't it terrible? Those poor people. That's pity. If you write a check and you send it for relief, that's compassion. And see, there's a difference there. Now, did God have pity on us when we fell? 
or did he have compassion? And so it's, it's different. Yeah, he sent his son. He set him on his own animal. Now, you know what that means. The man may have been riding, and he says, let's trade places. I'll walk, you ride. And isn't that what Jesus does with us? He says, I will give you my strength. I'll walk, and you ride. We're going to trade places. And he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. Now, where does he take him? Where's the inn? Where does Jesus send people after he saves them? Church. And notice, just to fill this out a little more, on the next day, he cares for him that afternoon or night, on the next day when he departed, he takes out two denarii, and he says to the innkeeper, and the innkeeper had a family that would take care of the guests, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Wow. So when the Lord redeems people, and they come to the church after they're saved, uh, then what's our responsibility? He says, you take care of them. And whatever you spend, now what's the implication there? Might we need to spend something to take care of people? But he says, when I come back, that's very important. Is the Samaritan coming back? Jesus said, I'll come again. And he said, I will repay you. Now before we leave this theme, I'm going to commingle my parables tonight because they go together. Turn in your Bible to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, and I'm going to go to verse 31. This is called the parable of the sheep and the goats, but it's got the same principle as the parable of the Good Samaritan. You only find this parable in Matthew. Matthew 25, 31. By the way, this parable comes at the end of Jesus' discourse on the second coming. There are no chapters. If you've got a red letter Bible, you'll notice the red letters begin with chapter 24 and they go straight through to the end of chapter 25 because he's talking about his coming and parables related to his coming. The ten virgins and so forth. This is the last parable. Matthew 25, 31, And when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all His holy angels with Him, He'll sit on the throne of His glory and all the nations will be gathered before them. And they'll separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Now, sheep and goats, did any of you see them on the road coming to church tonight? They got, I don't know if there's goats out there, but I saw a bunch of sheep. Sometimes they have the goats and the sheep together. And they're great mowing machines, which is why they're probably leased out for that field. And um, they do fine. They'll feed together. They don't bother each other too much. But they're very different when it comes to shearing the sheep and their natures and what they do with the animals. Um, you can get a lot more milk out of a goat. You'll get a lot more wool out of a sheep. So they're very different in that respect. So they would separate them. But he says, uh, he sets the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And here he mentions some specifics. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous, the sheep, they represent the righteous. They're on the right hand, a sign of favor. They'll say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Now, he then turns to the goats on the left. I heard a pastor say one time, one of the differences between sheep and goats is goats have a tendency to use their horns to butt. And he said, I've noticed that those that don't follow the Lord say, well, I would follow the Lord, but. <laughs> I would repent, but. <laughs> I would be a Christian, but. He said, I think a lot of butting going on. And uh, goats, I've, I've had goats. They are uh, definitely more rebellious. They're not near as docile as sheep. Um, a lot more independent and headstrong. And you don't want to turn your back on a billy goat. Does anyone know that? Don't ask me how I know. 
But um, then he says to the goats the same thing. Depart from me, cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The result of the fire is everlasting. And he says the same thing. Hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick, and in prison, and you didn't help me. I'll say, when did we neglect you, Lord? I'll say, as much as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So, what does that mean? You know, I was looking at that one time, and uh, all of the suffering of humanity is encompassed in those six things. Think about it. Hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick, prison. Just about any sadness you could describe would fit into one of those categories somehow. But is he just talking about physical hunger? No, let's, just say, let's make this clear. Should a Christian care about people that are hungry? Doesn't it say in Isaiah 58 that we distribute the food to the hungry? We care about those who are hungry. That we should, doesn't Jesus say, if you give a glass of water to even one of these little ones, you'll not lose your reward? We should give water to the thirsty. He asked a woman for a drink. And uh, Moses in his law talks a lot about the stranger among you, to show mercy on the stranger. And I was naked. The Bible says we should clothe the naked. And if you remember the battle where between Israel and the northern kingdom and they brought all these prisoners away naked and they were told by the prophet, what you've done has angered the Lord and they repented and they gave them clothes back. They clothed the naked. It talks about the sick and those in prison. And you came to me. Now, Christians should do that. We should feed the hungry, clothe the naked, so forth. I think it's great to have practical ministries. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that because I think everyone agrees. Um, it's kind of neat when we get together as a church family. Some of you know that we have our homeless bags. As Sister Quetzalcoatl helped organize and we gave out bags of food, little snacks and clothes and beanies and just things to give them out uh, every Christmas. And that's a wonderful thing to do. But that's not the only kind of hunger. If you go through your life a little bit hungry, but you have the bread of life, you're going to make it to eternity. But if you are full of food and hungry spiritually, you'll be lost. That's why Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. So, it's not just the physical thing Jesus is talking about. When he says, I was hungry and you gave me food, what kind of hunger? What kind of bread? Man doesn't live by bread alone. I was hungry and you gave me the bread of life. I was thirsty. Now is there a special kind of water Jesus talks about? You got regular water and you got living water, right? Jesus said when you got the gospel, the Holy Spirit wells up in artesian form like living water in your heart. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger. Well, there's people who are lonely and they're strangers, but if you are alienated from God, then that's really pretty bad. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked. Well, you don't want to see anyone like that. We should provide clothes, but what about a spiritual nakedness? And doesn't Jesus say to the lost, you don't know that you're poor and wretched and miserable, blind and naked. And so we give them the robe of Christ's righteousness. I was sick. It's not just physical sickness. Sick with sin. And Isaiah talks about those who are sick from the sole of their foot to the crown of their head. And he says, I was in prison. And, you know, there's a spiritual analogy for prison, too. Not just being in literal in prison, and we should have prison ministries, but those who are imprisoned by the devil. So Christ is describing here the ministry of the church, and then he says something amazing. He says, in as much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. So you do it for them, you're doing it for me. I really appreciate if you do it for them. But he doesn't mean that as a metaphor. He means it literally. Let me explain. He's not just saying that you know, politicians will say, I feel your pain, and I don't really think they do. Um, but it sounds good. But when Jesus says, when you do it for them, you're really doing it for me, you really are. Follow me. God is all-powerful, right? What's the word we use for that? Omnipotent. Omnipotent. And God is omnipresent. He can be everywhere. And God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. Now there's a fourth category a friend shared with me one time. It's a subcategory. God is omnipathic. What does pathos mean? To feel. 
Remember, I told you sympathy means to feel. Does God feel everything? Now, of course he does because God knows everything. So, does God know how you feel? If you're sad, does he know? Can you say, Lord, you have no idea? <laughs> does he know? I mean, he doesn't only know because Jesus became a man, so we would know that he knows. But even if Jesus never became a man, because God knows everything, he knows the thoughts of your heart, he knows every sensation of every nerve in your body, because he's God. I mean, you think of how powerful he is. Isn't that right? He knows everything. So if you're hungry and you feel pain, does he feel your pain? He feels your hunger pain? Does he feel your thirst? He opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. Does God know when the sparrow is hungry? The Bible says yes. So he feels everything. Now can you imagine what it would be like to feel all at one time the misery of a fallen world? Doesn't that make you shudder? God feels that all the time. And so if you do anything to give relief and joy to any creature, does God feel that relief? He definitely does. And so when Jesus said, in as much as you do it unto these, you know, the church is called the body of Christ. We really are. He feels every nerve in the body. And he also feels it among the lost. Anything you do to relieve the suffering of any creature, not just people, he feels. The Bible says the righteous man regards the life of his beast. So when Christ said, hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick in prison. Now I want to take it one step further. When Jesus hung on the cross, he took all the suffering of humanity. In those six things there, it describes all the suffering of humanity. Was Jesus on the cross hungry? He had not eaten in 24 hours. Was he thirsty? Now, are we guessing that he was thirsty, or did he say, I thirst? Was he a stranger? Did they know who he was? You know, the Bible says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And there's a spiritual that says, we didn't know who you were. They didn't know. Even after his own people didn't know who he was. And when he rose from the dead, two of the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they said, we thought that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, but I guess not, you know. They didn't really know. It says, I was naked and you clothed me. Did they take away his clothes at the cross? I was sick. Well, I think after you've been beaten like he was beat, you'd have more than a headache. And he felt sick. He whipped and crucified. I was in prison. Uh, can you be any more imprisoned than having your hands and your feet nailed to a piece of wood and suspended between heaven and earth? How hopeless could you feel? That's worse than being in the stocks or just in a jail cell. He says, I was prison and you came to me. So anything you do for any creature is helping to relieve the suffering of Christ that he experienced for his people. Because he says, if you've done it for the least of these, now you might say, you know, I got a friend, he's pretty important, he's asked for a favor, and you know, how can I say no? But he says it's not just the important. James says it's not just the, the big shots, it's not just people of intelligence and prestige, it's not just the good looking or the sophisticated. But he said, anything you do for one of the least of these, you've done it for me. Does the Lord value human life? He does. I think that we're going to find out someday what a serious thing it is for people to take human life so lightly. Um, I've got to be careful I don't get off on a tangent here, but you know, I could say a little bit of what, about what happens with abortion. Yeah. You realize that some of the philosophy that people have about abortion is based on, but they're so small, they're insignificant. That's really, I mean, they don't value human life as sacred, especially if you believe in evolution. You know, it's, it's an easy leap to make. But um, yeah, for Christians, they say, oh, but it's so small, it's not important. Well, where would I be if people were graded based on height? <laughs> I'd be less valuable than Abraham Lincoln. You know what I'm saying? So you, you can't judge life like that. But he says, the least of these my brethren, you've done it unto me. Well, I want to be in that group where he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And look at, their, look at their surprise when they get to the kingdom. 
they're going to say, oh, you mean, Lord, you noticed what we did for those people just because we loved and had compassion? you say, you not only did it for them, you did it for me. Have you heard where it says in Hebrews, some have entertained angels unaware. I've sometimes done something for, you know, a poor person. And um, then that verse comes to my mind and you think, maybe an angel disguised themselves as this person in need. And it was a test. Some have entertained angels unaware. And um, so, boy, wouldn't that be tragic to get to heaven and to find out you're in the group of goats? And the Lord say, you know how many times I was there where you could have done something nice for me, but instead of helping me, you butted me out the door. <laughs> or you butted me away. I'm talking to myself as I'm talking to you. But isn't that what's at the heart of this? So then Jesus, go back to Luke. We'll start and finish here. Go back to Luke chapter 10. And he says to the innkeeper, when I come again, I will repay you. Isn't that what we just read in Matthew? There's going to be a judgment day where he will separate the sheep from the goats. And we're going to be surprised how many times we've seen somebody that was beaten up by the thief and left in the road. There's varying degrees of that, but there are people in need and he doesn't want us to pass by them. You know, Karen and I just had an interesting experience in India. This is my third trip. It was her trip. And I told her, I said, you know, when I go this time, we are so blessed. I always come from home from India and I regret that we don't do something tangible to help the people there. And there's so many beggars that you see. And, you know, you're so busy. You're, <laughs> you're going from place to place to preach about Jesus. You don't have time to stop. And you, you do have to be discreet because I, I know one time we, we helped some of the beggars in, in Chennai and one of them saw us help the other and they just, they swarm in. You can't even get up the road. Uh, so, you know, you have to be prudent. You can't always do it. But uh, this trip, I said, you know, I want to take a, a pile of cash with me and I don't want to bring it home. I want to pray that God will give us opportunities to just give it away cause, and it's nothing for us compared to what it means to them. And Karen doesn't even know. Now she does because I'm going to say. But there were a couple of times when we were walking up the street and I would see somebody and I'd, I'd walk over and slip something in their hand and they didn't even speak the language. And there was this one, we were in that one place where we went around that park near Hyderabad. And there's some ladies, their job is to sweep the street and they walk up and down the streets with something. Their broom does not even have a handle. It's a bunch of, of, of brush that's all tied together. And their job, they get paid something extremely meager to sweep the streets. And I saw this one lady and she just looked so sad. And it was just about quitting time. The sun was going down and I walked over. She thought I was going to throw something in the trash bin because she was getting ready. She had just swept up some stuff to dump it in the trash bin. I walked over and she looked to get out of my way and I grabbed her hand and I stuck some money in her hands and then I walked away. I didn't want to ask for a reaction I, and I couldn't resist. After we were walking away with our group, uh, I looked over my shoulder and I'll never forget the look in her eyes. It was a look of just so much. She finally got what had happened. First she thought, was this an accident? What's happening? Am I in trouble? And I mean, she, there's a little bit of confusion I could tell for a moment. But she looked at me and it was just a look. Her eyes said, thank you. Um, couldn't, couldn't speak to each other, but she understood. Um, and I thought, boy, how sad that we don't do that more often. Uh, Christians ought to be just looking for opportunities all through their lives to just bless people. And it was nothing for us. We'll never miss it. Won't make any difference. We could give away so much and we will sleep in the same bed. We will drive the same car. We will live in the same house. Won't make any difference in our lives. It's no sacrifice. But that will make such a big difference in their life and it can bring them so much joy. And so I just pray that, uh, you know, we'll remember the principle of the uh, Good Samaritan that um, God is going to, through our lives, bring us, He'll expose us to people in need and we want to do what we can to uh, relieve the suffering. Someday there'll be a judgment. God gives us opportunities to be His servants, His stewards, to represent His kingdom, give them physical bread and water, but also the spiritual bread and water. Amen? Amen. Before we sign off with our friends that are watching online, I want to remind you we have a free offer. We'll send this to you. It's a book I wrote about prayer. 
something uh, very important. Get us through the last days. And it's called Teach Us to Pray. It takes the Lord's Prayer and it breaks it down. If you'd like a free copy of that, you've got to text. This is, you don't email it. You text the word PRAY, P-R-A-Y, to 40544. 40544. And we'll send that to you. God bless. And Lord willing, we'll tune in again together uh, this Sabbath and then again next Tuesday.